So we continue to pivot a little bit from the traditional orthopedic uh, orthopedic surgeon story, and we did that today too. And it's actually a really good episode. This is about education for you as our listeners. And I think that regenerative medicine is a really complicated space. PRP stem cells, does it work? Does it not work? Is it worth all the extra money? Who do I go to? All of these super important questions. What is a stem cell in PRP? How does it work? So we bring you Stephen Sampson, who's literally, you know, one of our country's leading regenerative medicine docs. He's been doing it for over 15 years, well ahead of the curve. He's really all about evidence-based. He's about outcomes. He's about uh, making sure that patients understand the technology, the science, and how it works. I think this is going to be a very worthwhile episode for all to listen. I hope you like it. We continue to thank our sponsor, OrthoLaser Orthopedic Laser Centers. They continue to offer MLS M8 technology for chronic and acute orthopedic pain as an alternative source to opioids and possibly even avoiding surgery. The franchises continue to spread across the country. It's an amazing opportunity for orthopedic surgeons and doctors and even medical device reps to become part of the growing technology. Ortho Laser Milwaukee and Ortho Laser Rochester just opened. We have another five in the queue. Come and join the Ortho Laser franchise family. Hashtag follow the fro. From Medical Media, this is The Ortho Show. Hello world, Dr. Scott Sigmund, your favorite opioid sparing orthopedic surgeon here for another episode of The Ortho Show podcast, where we bring you the best of the best in the orthopedic world. Today, we're going to pivot just a little bit from our classic traditional orthopedic uh, uh, guests, and we're moving into the complex and sometimes misunderstood world of regenerative medicine. We have Dr. Stephen Stampson, who is one of the leading regenerative medicine doctors in the, in the United States. He's world-renowned. He's the physician founder of the Ortho Healing Center, founder and president of TOBI, or the Ortho Biologic Institute, one of the great uh, uh, seminars or society meetings that happens on an annual basis. We're going to talk about that as well as the co-founder and president of ortho of the ortho healing method. Stephen, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me. No, it's my pleasure. So how's sunny California treating you guys out there right now? I can see the sun in the background. It's actually shining right off of that beautiful head of yours. You know, it's like, <laughs> we're having a great contrast in hair here today with the, uh, well, I know that the, 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 the guests can't see it, but it's a lot of fun. So great to have you on. Thank you. I think we represent the yin and yang from the fro to the, the bald head. There you uh, go. I things love are it. good here. That's excellent. Well, I'm glad to hear you guys are finally getting out. And I think COVID's settling down a little bit and you guys are starting to space out and move around a little bit. I'm sure you've had your vaccine at this point. Yes, double vaccinated, staff vaccinated, a lot of patients in the community vaccinated. They're coming out of the woodwork. Things are really picking up in the office, which is great. Yeah, that's fantastic. All right. So let's talk, let's just start right at the beginning and then we'll sort of roll in. And I, you know, what I always like to make sure, you know, is my mother's listening to the show. We have a lot of, you know, non-technical people that really enjoy the broadcast. And I think it would be great for all of the things that we're discussing to try and sort of almost discuss it as if you were telling it to one of your patients, because I think that's a great way for people to listen and understand, because I think the world of regenerative medicine in particular is really uh, is sort of misunderstood, trying to work its way into, into standard of care and treatments. And, and so really that's what we want to talk about. So my first question for you is, why is regenerative medicine, you know, it's one of my favorite lines, like the Grateful Dead and Black Licorice, you know, you either love it or you hate it. What, what's the deal? That's a good point. I think traditionally, if you look at medicine, anything that's new in general is met with great skepticism. For example, the arthroscope that was uh, introduced initially, some of the founders were shunned from medical societies and later given uh, uh, a word of appreciation. Same thing happened with LASIK. So I think traditionally in medicine, there's a conservative mindset and some things may threaten the system, require more training, change the way we're doing things. And so some uh, doctors that maybe are set in their ways have a harder time embracing new approaches to care. And then granted, with anything new, it takes time for data and results, and the process has to evolve and be refined and improved. So 
I think I think there's there's this polarity, but I've really seen over the last 15 years since I got into it. Um, more and more acceptance, which is interestingly driven by the patient. It's patients pushing this field where doctors are forced to have a informed opinion as to why they're not offering them or what their stance is. Yeah, you know, you know, it's interesting. We've had we've had Bert Mandelbaum on, who I know you spent some time with when you first went out mm-hmm. to Los Angeles, and Bert was really savvy and astute and really how he described where you know regenerative medicine is. If you take a look, I mean, I'm I'm clearly convinced it's on the upswing at this point, right? I mean, 15 years ago, everybody's like, "What is this stuff?" Uh, but now it's you can't pick up a journal without reading at least one article about you know some sort of form of of regenerative medicine. And we'll we're gonna I want to take a deep dive onto what that definition is and what these things are and and what's available for our patients that, that are out there for sure. But you know what what do you think is needed uh, to get across the chasm? You know we talk about the Rogers curve of innovation, right? The early adopters. When are we going to get to the early majority of adoption where perhaps even maybe insurance companies may pay for this? Because at the end of the day, right now, it's a patient pay model. Yeah, I agree. I think we're going to reach, we call it tipping point, where um, there's a shift in the access to biologics in the community becomes a standard. And I think in order to get that shift, you need widespread access, which means we need insurance reimbursement for biologics. And, you know, biologics refers to these cell-based therapies to treat orthopedic injuries, whether it's managing inflammation or pain. And so we're starting to see more big players in the market, these biopharmaceutical companies that are investing to play safely with the FDA and go through the proper regulatory channels. And so while I'm a huge advocate of natural-based therapies, including PRP, I think ultimately we may have insurance approval for more pharmaceutical-based biologic injection products like amniotic tissue and whatnot. Uh, And it'll become the tipping point when an orthopedic surgeon that primarily sees a lot of joint disease as an alternative to trying an arthroplasty or superior to using a gel hyaluronic acid, a lubricant, this is another tool that they can consider using. Yeah, no, I, I think that's that's a that's a really good point. And uh, that's one of the things that I was sort of going to talk about, because, you know, regenerative medicine it really crosses a number of different specialties, right? I, I'd be curious at the Toby, for example, how many different specialists uh, within medicine come to that course to learn how to do it? Just give us an idea of the various types of doctors that are involved. Yeah, so Toby was unique where we created a conference to really bring a very eclectic mix that all had a common vision or goal of understanding these cell therapies. So we'll have plastic surgeons, orthopedic surgeons, rheumatologists, neurologists, veterinarian surgeons, uh, stem cell PhDs, you know, all, all gathering together to share best practice and advance the field. And I would add, interestingly, if you look at the roots of biologics, for example, platelet-rich plasma or PRP, for those that aren't familiar with it, it's just taking blood from the arm and spinning the blood. And there's four layers and you filter out the plasma and the platelets and then inject them back into an injury. The origin started from dentistry. And so in the late 1990s, Um, dentists were seeing that uh, implants were not healing with the gums. And so they were fascinated, why are some tissues healing and others being infected and not taking their implant? And that led to the discovery of PRP and gradually into animals and humans for orthopedic issues. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's fascinating. Thank you for bringing that up. And I just find that, you know, as an orthopedic surgeon, you know, I'm old, I got a lot of gray hairs, but you know, I still like to make changes when things come through. And am I using regenerative medicine? Sure I am. But have I dived into it as, as much as, as I would say into my surgical practice? The answer is no. Obviously, I also involved in laser with ortho laser when we, we were running through similar sort of uh, headwind, headwinds that we both have to go through, I think, to be able to get our modalities more accepted. But I just yep. think it's it can be confusing, unfortunately, because, you know, some of the things that are happening out there and, and one of the topics I really want to talk about is this wild, wild west phenomenon of people being able to make crazy claims about about what regenerative medicine can do. And then you've got you guys, which are science based, evidence based, po- you know, putting out studies and really trying to to move this this regenerative medicine forward. But yet then you see these crazy things going on. What are your thoughts on the. On, on these wild claims that many of these docs or even non-doctors are making? 
Yeah, I'm very passionate about the potential and the benefits of cell-based therapies. And with it comes along opportunists or bad actors. And it's a problem. And what happened was this field just exploded so quickly before uh, you know, the field could get a consensus. And there's multiple organizations, societies, um, and you have these rogue physicians taking care of vulnerable patients that are desperate for relief. And I give a lecture commonly, and there's one from California here where the doctor had a lasagna on the ad, and it was, you know, have this and enjoy this wonderful lasagna and learn how stem cells can regenerate your cartilage. And so it's really important to get the right messaging to doctors that are doing this responsibly. There are um, speed limits to stay within the regulatory safe zone and not make false claims and really be honest with your patients, which is what they want. And so we have this phenomenon where nurse practitioners uh, are injecting for chiropractic doctors that don't have the appropriate training. Um, they're not vetting the products they're using, which are resulting in infections, hospitalizations, poor outcomes, and just an overall bad mark on the field where some patient may think, oh, well, I had, quote, stem cell therapy and it didn't work. I just had a patient who spent $18,000 in Mexico getting embryonic stem cells to both knees and intravenous uh, treatments, and it did nothing for her, and that will change their view of the field in general, but they were just with, you know, probably not the best opportunity. Yeah, I was I was in a cab in Vegas. I wasn't going to Toby, but I was going to another course, and this woman found me. She knew it was like an orthopedic course, and so the driver's like, yeah, you know, I had stem cells done, you know, for both of my knees, and I'm really so excited. I'm, you know, I was a little bummed that I had to take out the home equity loan on my house to be able to get the stem cell, and I'm just like sulking down in the in my chair in the back. You know, it's like, yeah, you know, look, if you're taking out loans from your house to be able to have stem cells for your knees, you first at least better make sure you're going to someone that's reputable and is doing doing the real deal, right? And uh, I, I was afraid for her that that probably was not the truth. Now, what's, what's going on with this lasagna thing? How is there a lasagna ad? I, I went over my head. I'll send it to you, but it's an example of physicians trying to entice patients that, you know, they have to go out of their way and offer a free meal for a lecture to learn about stem cells and how it can, you know, <laughs> regenerate your cartilage. And I have multiple, I collect several that, you know, are a big eyesore, but patients are vulnerable. They want help and I get it. Like the standard physician doesn't have enough in their toolbox and many people want to avoid a joint replacement, especially if they're young and active under 60, they need some more time and try other options. But, you know, doctors are a bit handcuffed what we have. And so these patients go online and every website is an expert in stem cell therapy. And there's false claims that violate the FTC guidelines, you know, guaranteeing outcomes and pain relief. And it's, it's a problem. Uh, and that's why as a society, a community, we need to really get a consensus and inform patients what to look for. Yeah, and I agree. And the FDA really seemed to be doing a really good job with that pre-pandemic. They really were starting to, to, to lock down on a lot of these false claims and these uh, various types of regenerative medicine that really weren't working. Uh, hopefully they'll sort of ramp that up again post-pandemic now as, as we're, we're not in exactly post-pandemic yet, but as we move away from it for sure. Uh, you know, Dottie Buford's one of our dear friends. He's a friend of yours as yeah. well. You know, he has his cease and desist wall, you know, for, yeah. for all the letters <laughs> that he's received from these companies telling him to cease and desist his claims. But, you know, he's really become a, a real police officer of the regenerative space and nobody knows it better than him. So I rely. The good news is for, for me and a lot of other people, you know, we can watch, stand back and listen to you guys and try and get us and cipher out the real detail, the real evidence that's going to help us to, to move forwards. And, you know, even again, going, you know, sort of going back for me as a clinician, right? Is it leukocyte poor PRP? Is it leukocyte rich PRP? Is it, and so what does that mean for our listeners? Well, there's white cells and do you add the white cells. Do you not add the white cells? And so, you know, until there's truly a standardization protocol, that's going to really be, that's going to develop where we can, we can follow, you know, I think it's still, you know, it's still out there waiting for, for more and more evidence-based uh, research to come out to be able to help guide us on our decision-making process. Yeah, it's a great point. And, you know, the more and more I've been practicing medicine, I, get, I just understand with biologics and these cell-based therapies, it's a combination of science with art. 
And there's a lot of creativity. And while I'm not an orthopedic surgeon, I would imagine when you're doing a cuff repair or an ACL, there are technical components, but then there's an ability of art and creativity and you know, what's going into that procedure. And so um, you know, PRP and these biologics, it's hard to really standardize them because every patient is different. I may take your blood and check your platelets at 9 a.m. And then later at 4 p.m. have a different platelet count or, you know, um, your associate may have different platelet levels. So it's, it's challenging to standardize, but that's where our directions are. Um, and that's where we may see more of these other products that are more likely to standardize what's in each in injection. Yeah, I mean, I really like the idea of the FDA approval process. I mean, it's one of those things that we rely on. And I definitely think that will help to sort of push forward for the field. Let's uh, let's educate a little bit. Um, so sure. let's talk. Let's ca- talk through some of the the various types of regenerative medicine, and we'd love your perspective on those and and where we're going. So we've talked a bunch about PRP. I think people sort of get a sense for that. Let's move over to stem cells at this point. So bone marrow aspirate concentrate. What is it? How are you using it? You know, what are the best applications? What's going on? Great point. So there, there are these different generations of biologics or cell therapies, and PRP is the first generation. And then uh, with that, more 2.0 is using bone marrow concentrate. And it's important not to call it bone marrow stem cell therapy, because in reality, when you look under a microscope and you count the traditional number of cells in the um, soup, so to speak, there are very few, like 0.01% are actual, these mesenchymal stem cells, or we call medicinal signaling cells. That doesn't mean that bone marrow can't be very effective. My theory is that bone marrow is loaded with anti-inflammatory proteins called IRAP. So when you have an arthritic knee that's inflamed and you look inside that fluid in the joint, it contains inflammatory proteins. And so the bone marrow concentrate can neutralize those and reduce the inflammation and help with healing. Um, and so bone marrow I've used for about 10 plus years, and I still really like it. It's just so safe and anti-inflammatory when you choose the proper patient selection. Um, it's, it's worked quite well for us. We published on our outcomes and more and more data continues to you know, emerge. So bone marrow, I look at as more of a 2.0 PRP. So if a patient has arthritis of the knee and it's mild to moderate and they're active, studies have shown PRP can be effective. In fact, more than a gel injection of hyaluronic acid. But when their pathology of their arthritis is more moderate or limiting and severe on x-ray or an MRI, that's where we consider bone marrow concentrate or using adipose, which is another option. You know, it's interesting. I, I always, when my patients talk to me and they ask me about this stuff, I often say, well, you know, there's, I don't think there's any question about it. There's just too much positive information within the literature to suggest that BMAC and PRP don't work. For somebody to say it just doesn't work, you know, that's ridiculous. I mean, the evidence is starting to mount. The thing that you were just describing with, with, the, with the proteins inside the BMAC, I think that's fascinating because ultimately speaking, I think what we're doing right now is we're shooting a shotgun, right? And inside some of those pellets, you know, those pellets are the ones that are really creating this anti-inflammatory, you know, process and healing process. Wouldn't it be cool to be able to shoot the rifle and find out which pellets are the ones that are really creating, you know, the process? And I think, I think that we're going to head that way. I really do. And, uh, you know, I think that, you um, it's sort of like, you know, with our laser, we use laser for, for COVID, believe it or not. And our study is yeah. just about ready to be published for that. We're excited. And if you think about, you know, what COVID and inflammation, so inflammation is basically mediated by these proteins. You're right. Cytokines, mm-hmm. pro-inflammatory proteins. And then if you could have these other proteins that turn off the pro-inflammatory proteins, you get less pain and discomfort. And I think that's exactly what's happening within BMAC. I think you're spot on. And so I remember vividly, I'm in my office, it's probably about five years ago. And there was a, there was a, a, a medical device rep that went into the, to a different company. I knew her well. She came to me and said, look, doc, I got this new thing. I want to show it to you. Do you think you would, you know, potentially try it? And I said, yeah, you know, sure. We got a relationship. I'll try it. Or at least I'll look at it. She brings it over to me and it's for adipose stem cells. And she's showing this doctor taking this like liposuction type thing into a thigh, sort of, sort of pulling fat out from underneath. And I'm yeah. like, I'm like, dude, I'm like, 
that is just not going to happen by an orthopedic surgeon. I'm like, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm like, that, that is just not visually attractive to me. It's like not something that I feel even remotely comfortable doing. I have no training in it. So I'm like, that ain't happening. So what's happened in the adipose world? Yeah, and those are good questions too. And it also reminds me of, uh, you know, I was interested in bone marrow concentrate and I visited a clinic about 10 years ago and they did a marrow aspirate on an uh, o- obese patient with a CAT scan and the patient was in a lot of pain. And I said, I'm never doing that. And then as the data and the science kept coming, I figured there's got to be a better way. And so we developed a technique, uh, had Jay Smith, who's at Mayo come and we used ultrasound to identify the landmarks and create a much more comfortable procedure. So overall patients have about a two out of 10 discomfort. Uh, And they're traditionally done in the office. Some patients can be done at an ASC and they have conscious sedation at a surgery center. Um, So adipose is another option. And so I think at a 10,000 foot view, you say, look, the human body is really remarkable. And every second, 15 million blood cells die and are being regenerated. So we're a cellular being. And when you mentioned COVID, these cells run haywire and there are too much inflammation. And so the theory is there are ways to affect the cell metabolism of the human body, whether it's injecting with bone marrow or plasma or perhaps fat or using a laser, or I've gotten into something called shockwave therapy, which is another way of something called mechanotransduction, which tricks the body into thinking it's exercising and loading to then create and boost some of these stem cells and anti-inflammatory proteins. So adipose is just another cell source and it acts as a cushion. And so it's thick uh, in consistency and um, it has reparative properties. And the problem with adipose has been a lot of ambiguity or uncertainty is like, is it kosher? Can we do it with the FDA? Is it considered a drug? What's called homologous use, which means can, is this tissue naturally uh, residing in a knee or are you taking a foreign tissue from one part of the body to the other, even if it's in the same patient? So adipose has had a bit of controversy and misinformation about that. And more recently, there's been a little bit more transparency. And so, and so that's great. And I want to go to one more, and then I want to ask you a question for my mother. Um, so, so amniotic, you know, uh, cells at this point, where is it coming from? It's for jelly here, it's amnion from there, you know, more, everybody now is saying there's no, there's no live stem cells in these things. Why are people claiming it? The FDA is pulling people off left and right. Where is amniotic tissue in, in 2021? I think it's on the uptick, but with anything, you're going to see more bad actors get called out. And those that are legitimately working with the FDA, there's going to be more commercialization available. And so there are a couple of amniotic uh, companies that have their RMAT designation, which is um, a seal from the FDA, and they continue to work together towards eventual approval. And they have these multi-center trials with Jack Farr's done, as you may know, and, um, and, and another company is also in phase three trials for both osteoarthritis and plantar fasciitis. So I think you're going to have one or two major players that have a standardized product that can be injected safely and will be proven to be effective and eventually be covered by insurance. But then you have this like lower tiered Uh, pharmaceutical companies that don't quite have the quality of labs, the regulatory oversight and compliance with the FDA, and they're going after low-hanging fruit of chiropractic doctors or misinformed doctors. And these doctors can get sued for using these products. I've been expert witness on some of these cases where an orthopedic surgeon didn't know the product they had was laced with Enterobacter or E. coli, which is, you know, can cause infections. And they thought they were helping their patients. And these patients spent thousands of dollars and the product wasn't approved by the FDA. In fact, many of the cells are dead cells. So the amniotic tissue, I think the safe zone is eventually having a product that doesn't have live, quote, stem cells, but proteins are growth factors, almost like a PRP from a newborn. But the, the potential benefit is that you could standardize and quantify each injection dose, like hyaluronic acid, a gel shot. So when you inject that patient's knee, you know what's going into them. Whereas most of these amniotic products that are available, it's a crapshoot, it's hit or miss. And worst case scenario, you might have infected cells. It just just blows me away 
that in 2021, people can get away with this stuff. I mean, it's like, how does the company that does not have the appropriate FDA backing or, you know, or, or license or whatever the word is, I, I apologize, but how do they go around selling this stuff? And, and how can you do that legally? And it just doesn't seem fair or right. Yeah, I agree with you. It, it seems like the, the FDA has their hands full with the regulatory oversight and, you know, focusing on really the extreme cases um, and that's why you have doctors like Donnie Buford out there that are, for good reason, policing the field, you know, to protect the field. And we want to work with the FDA and partner so we disseminate that information to too many docs because you're going to see more and more docs use some of these unrecommended products and get into trouble um, and sadly affect patients and, you know, leave a bad mark on the field. So it's really important to police that. Yeah, great stuff. So. You know, so last year, Toby, 2020 was a virtual meeting. I had a lot of fun with Scotty Zeitzer and you got, you invited me on for a little virtual fun and we had a nice little hour long presentation, but uh, you got to be excited for Toby 2021. What's in store? So for Toby 2021, we're really excited. We're offering a brand new um, experience, so to speak. But in order for us to deliver that experience, what we're going to be doing in 2021 is we're going to be all digital and our event will be in the fall. So approximately October 7th to 9th. And it'll be a virtual experience unlike anyone that you know no one's really done before, really interactive with um, you know some great content. And then in 2022, we will be a hybrid. So we're always going to include that digital interactive experience that people really liked. Um, and we have it live versus a traditional webinar experience. Um, so I'd, I'd say for the fall of 2021, we're going to be all digital, but a very interactive, super cool experience to bring everybody together. That's awesome. So, you know, and it's like anything else, you know, Matthew Ray Scott, dear friend of mine, he's always like, Scott, what's going to happen after this pandemic? And, you know, what's going to change? And the answer is everything's going to change. So the idea of going back to January 1st of 2020 and just doing what we used to do is gone. People love the idea of sitting at home, going to a virtual meeting, getting CME and being able to not have to travel and do all that, but you still want to travel too, then you can do that as well. But one of the things, you know, one of the things that's super important, and that's orthopedic surgery and it's regenerative medicine, is you need you need hands-on training. You need to. So a lot of the reasons, one of the major reasons that I think that the the that my generation of orthopedic surgeons is not embracing regenerative medicine more is because we weren't taught ultrasound. And so you're not. So not only do you have to learn about regenerative medicine, but now you have to learn a new technique with the yeah. ultrasound to guide to make sure you're doing the right thing. And so you know, I think it's a little bit of a struggle, but I think all of the new kids on the block that are fresh out of residency are all going to be ultrasound trained. They're going to be savvy in that, which I think also helps the process. But don't you think we're still going to need some hands-on training for the ultrasound techniques? Definitely. And yeah. Definitely. And, you know, so I created Toby uh, 15 years ago uh, as a sincere motivation just to bring together doctors that were excited about this and to you know present the science and do best practice and it started with 20 doctors in los angeles and it was a weird mix from saudi arabia philippines and spain and it grew to a thousand doctors from 40 countries and so it's really important you know to continue to stay connected and so what i found was despite doctors learning how to do an ultrasound or do a, a, a correct procedure and learn some of the protocols it wouldn't stick. They'd go back home and they're not comfortable explaining these treatments to their, their patients, or it takes too much time drawing the blood, or the patients get worse before they get better because it's natural healing. So it wasn't sticking. And so what we're developing as we're rolling out with Toby is this mentorship program, which I really think is the critical missing glue uh, to really get somebody to do this and do it right and continue to support them through the process. So we've had trial and error over the years where I used to have um, like maybe 50 to 100 doctors come in shuttle buses to my office and watch live procedures at the beginning of Toby. Then we videotape them and then we have cadaver labs. And so what we're really realizing is patients, uh, doctors need these small group uh, trainings and mentorship. And so we have opportunities for doctors to visit 
uh, a Toby faculty at the highest level and really see how their clinic runs, not just to learn how to do an injection that many might know, but the you know in-betweens, the ins and outs of having a successful practice. Yeah, we hear, hear the word mentor on the ortho show a lot. And that's, uh, I think that's a real pay it forward wet method to be able to you know, take the knowledge that you've learned and be able to pass it down. So that's great for you guys. I'm glad you're doing that. So, you know, I, I hate to bring this topic up because it's always an issue, right? All right. So this is not paid for by insurance, right? There's really no commercial payers at this point. So for the listeners that are out there that are really thinking about, you know, stem cells or PRP, I'm not going to ask you for your price specifically, but what is a decent price for a patient to be able to think about for the, how much money they should be paying. Let's run through, let's run through each. So let's talk about BMAC. Let's talk about PRP. Let's talk about adipose. And then maybe the, the, we'll leave amniotic off. Cause I still think that's out, out, in the, out there at this point, but yeah. for those three, what's a national average decent price that someone should feel good about when they're thinking about this? You know, it, it depends on the region and the level of the doctor's experience and the quality of what you're getting. So that spectrum or region for a PRP could be as low as $500 in a rural area or outside a major Midwestern city. Um, and it can be uh, close to $2,000 for, um, you know, a major metropolitan area. And then it varies and the patient doesn't quite know what they're getting in terms of the quality of the platelet, the preparation. Um, we don't like to do what we call dump and go, which is just a simple joint injection that, again, getting back to the art um, in terms of really spending time with the patient and teasing out where their pain's coming from and comprehensively treating that knee as opposed to just draining the knee and injecting it. We might target some of the surrounding ligaments or soft tissue um, you know, to really tease that out. And then patients may require between one to three PRP injections say if we just use knee arthritis as an example, um, so that you get a longer sustained benefit versus coming into the office regularly for frequent shots. Um, and then you have bone marrow concentrate, which um, may vary anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000, upwards of 5,000. And there's more expensive equipment required to process the bone marrow, a greater learning curve and training, and more time that that patient's gonna be in your office. Um, and some, you know, greater technical skill required. And so that's the spectrum. And then I would say adipose is probably around the same price point that you have with bone marrow, which is around, you know, $2,000 to $5,000, depending on, um, you know, your region. And if you do additional body regions, then there's going to be additional fees added on. That's fantastic. Really appreciate your honesty and sincerity there. And so, you know, as we're getting ready to close here, I want you to sort of talk to our audience and sort of sort of best summarize for them, you know, you know, what they should be looking for in a doctor when it comes to finding someone that's skilled in regenerative medicine. I think it's a great point. And I think rather than just looking at their website and hearing that they're an expert, I think it would be really good to kind of do some research on them, look at their reviews, their reputation online. Um, you know, speak with their staff, find out how often they do this. These cell-based therapies require an expertise. It's not something you can do well on the side. Um, and so, you know, someone who really dedicates a portion of their practice to this, I think is really important. Um, perhaps seeking out someone who may have uh, contributed to an article and, you know, collects outcomes. That's an important part we do if we have a data registry so we can determine who's getting better and not and affect our our judgments, look at their CV and their credentials, and then just have an honest consultation and you don't have to commit. And you know, I'm always very transparent and honest and I've, I've been successful setting the bar low with my patients that look, we can try this. It may or may not work for you. The alternative is a joint replacement and you might be too young for that or it may not be effective for you and you can't take it back but you need to be willing to do this and know there's a chance it may not be effective for you or grading the criteria and telling them, look, you're more likely to get better than not, but you have to understand there's a chance you may not improve. Yeah. I mean, that's awesome. I mean, here at the ortho show, we bring a lot of different perspectives. We bring the stories of doctors. We also like to really educate our patients. And this is really an area where I think people need that education. And I can't thank you enough, Steve, for really being so so detailed and, and down to earth in your descriptions and how you're using this and where you think the science is going to be going. That's great. I appreciate it. And for me, I've realized 
my passion is to spread the reach of these orthobiologic cell therapies to the community. And doing so requires a partnership with physicians so that they don't get in trouble and they can do best practice. They can have successful practices, which then will translate into more patients being treated and partner with industry that has the funding to support the data collection and the safety and working with FDA, et cetera. So it's really a true team effort in bringing together multiple specialties of orthopedic surgery, sports medicine, doctors, industry, and continually recognizing this is the future. There's so much potential here, but we all need to work together. Yeah, fantastic. Our job here at the Ortho Show podcast is to bring you the best of the best. We did that today with Dr. Stephen Sampson. We can't thank you enough. This is Dr. Scott Sigmund, hashtag follow the fro, host of the Ortho Show. Till next time.